Welcome to Cold War Conversations, the home of real stories of the Cold War. Trevor quickly realised that if he tried to, to go to the loo, he'd have to take his jacket off. And if he took his jacket off, they'd see his gun. He really ate and drank almost nothing while he was inside that embassy. It's, it's really one of the most heroic cases of self-imposed constipation you could ever imagine. But he managed to do it and he kept the gun hidden throughout until the very, very final moments when he and the lead gunman, Taufik, found themselves in a death grapple. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. On April the 30th, 1986, heavily armed gunmen burst into the Iranian embassy in London, where they took 26 hostages, including embassy staff, visitors and three British citizens. I talk with Britain's best-selling historian, Ben McIntyre, who has written a new book called The Siege, the remarkable story of the greatest SAS hostage drama. The book details the tense six-day siege as millions gathered around their screens across the UK to witness the longest news flash in British television history, in which police negotiators and psychiatrists sought a bloodless end to the standoff while the SAS, hitherto an organisation shrouded in secrecy, lay plans for a daring rescue mission, Operation Nimrod. It's a cracking, fast-paced story of what really happened on those fateful six days and the first full account of a moment that forever changed the way Britain thought about the SAS and itself. I'm delighted to welcome Ben McIntyre to our Cold War conversation. Now, I was 18 years old at the time this event happened, innocently watching a John Wayne film, Rio Lobo, whilst millions of other people were probably watching the snooker final, to be interrupted by a news flash showing the SAS live on TV attacking the Iranian embassy in London. And it was a momentous moment for British TV because we'd never seen anything like that before. Well, funnily enough, you know, I was one of those 14 million watching the snooker on the other side, the final, it was coming down to the final frames between Hurricane Higgins and Cliff Thorburn. I was with my dad, it was a bank holiday Monday. And you're right, suddenly every channel switched over to black suited soldiers with machine guns in balaclava helmets, ranging across the front of the Iranian embassy, throwing bombs inside and attacking a building. I had never seen anything like it before. I was, I was 11. And I sometimes think it's one of the reasons why I became a journalist and became a sort of foreign correspondent to begin with in my career, because it, it, it made news seem utterly different from the rather pallid way news had always been presented to us up until that point, you know, newscasters over sort of rehearsed footage. Here was history taking place in our living rooms. I mean, we're used to it now, of course, because, you know, digitization and mobile phones mean that we're used to seeing history happen on the hoof, as it were, but but no one had ever seen anything like this before. And I think it had a, I mean, it was one of the many long-term impacts of this episode was that it changed our perception of what news could be from that moment on, I think. Absolutely. Now, there's a number of written accounts of the the siege and the ending of the siege. What brought you to visit this subject? Why did you think there was a, a new book needed on the subject? I've wanted to write this book for many years. I, I first thought about it really seriously when I was writing a previous book about the SAS, Rogue Heroes, which was the result of an invitation from the SAS, an authorised book it was, to have access to their files and write the wartime history of the SAS. And when I was finishing that up, I said to, to the people I've been dealing with at, at the regiment, I said, you know, I'd really love to write the embassy siege story. And they said, absolutely not. They said, that is not going to happen because it's too sensitive. It's too close to the knuckle. We can't be seen to be sort of telling that story and not telling other stories. So it's taken about eight years of conversations of different sorts 
to persuade the Ministry of Defence to allow me to have access to all the living witnesses from the SAS side. That was That's the major breakthrough that I had here, was that the people who had actually taken part in this incident were officially permitted to speak to me or to speak publicly for the first time. Now, and that was really important because, as I'm sure you know, there is there's an old sort of joke that goes, you know, if everybody who claimed to have been on that balcony had actually been on that balcony, it would have fallen off. Because <laughs> it's one of the things that, you know, we're all used to the joke about people coming up to the bar and saying, well, I was in the SAS and I took part in the Iranian embassy siege. Well, as it happens, the number of people who actually did take part in that embassy siege is vanishingly small. I have the order of battle. I know exactly who took part. And there were not many people. There is only one person still alive who was on the front balcony, and I've spoken to him again. He had never told his story before. So in some ways, I wanted to demystify this story because the speed with which it became part of our national legend was quite extraordinary. I mean, it was immediately absorbed into a story of Thatcherism, of anti-terrorist operations, of sort of post-imperial British daring do. It was presented to me as, a, as, as I was growing up as a teenager as if it was a story of pure driven black and white, goodies and villains, you know, uh, heroes versus, versus the other side, wicked terrorists and brave SAS soldiers going in. And of course, like most myths, that is partly true. I mean, there is, you know, that, that is sort of in a way the core, the essence of the story. But the real story, as often with these stories that we inherit as a sort of cultural idea, the real story is far more complicated and, and far more interesting and far more about people than it is really about politics. It, uh, one has to remember, and we can go back to this because it is really the, the significance of this story. Margaret Thatcher had only been in power for a year when this event took place. Her hold on power was not very strong. She was facing major problems in Northern Ireland and elsewhere. And this was the first real test of her character. And it's where, in a way, the Iron Lady story was born because she took a real gamble and she was absolutely determined in what she decided. Now, you can decide whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, but the reality was it put the stamp on her premiership thereafter. Had it gone the other way, had the siege ended in a bloodbath, which, it has to be said, the SAS was warning her that it probably would, they were predicting 40% casualties. Had that happened, a whole series of things would not have happened. I think the, the, we would not have had the Thatcher Premiership in the style that we had it. I don't think, certainly not so quickly. It changed and solidified her attitude towards terrorism generally. It, it created a kind of mythology around her and about her use of the armed forces. I mean, forever after, from that moment on, whenever she did something particularly forthright or tough, the newspaper cartoonists would depict her wearing combat gear, abseiling down the outside of Big Ben. So it became a kind of light motif <laughs> for, her, for her premiership in a way. And the other thing, the other impact that it had, and we can go back to all of this, is that it brought the SAS into the limelight, into the light, in a way that it had never been before. Most people in the UK had never heard of the SAS before this happened. Had it Again, had it gone the other way, there's quite a strong likelihood that the regiment that, 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 that would have been disbanded, would have been absorbed into it was it was under pressure anyway. I, it would probably have disappeared. So, it has a it has a long term historical and political and military significance for this country. I, I just want to go back to the the well almost before the start of the siege. What were the political motivations of the gunmen? What were their reasons for attacking the Iranian embassy in London? Well, again, I think this is fascinating. If you asked most people what that episode was about, they would probably say Iranian fundamentalism, that it was about sort of Islamic extremists. But it really wasn't. The context is, is that the, the Iranian revolution had taken place a year earlier in 1979, bringing to power the hardline Ayatollah and his clerics, and the people in that embassy, the, the, the Iranian ambassador, Chargé d'Affaires, and his, his diplomats were all devotees of the Ayatollah. They were representatives of this new, radical, hardline revolutionary state. The gunmen who burst in there on that morning in April 1980 were opposed to the Ayatollah. 
They were Arabs from the minority Arab group in the southwest of Iran, the oil-rich region of Iran. They had long campaigned for more political rights, and they had been led to believe, the, the political ones among them, that the revolution in Iran was going to bring them the political rights, equality, effectively. They were a thoroughly oppressed minority. It was going to bring them the equality that they, that they craved. On the contrary, the Ayatollah and his security forces cracked down with maximum brutality. There was an event called Black Wednesday that had occurred just a few months earlier before the Arabian embassy siege. Many were killed. Each of the six had been involved in those protests, and each of them had lost family members. The leader of the group, a man called Tawfiq al-Rashidi, had lost his brother, who had been captured by the Iranian security forces, tortured and brutally murdered. So I'm not making excuses for these people at all. These six men were men of violence. But the easiest way to make a man into a killer is to kill the thing that he loves. And they had a they had a cause, they had a belief, and they had a plan. Their plan was to enter the Iranian embassy, take hostage Iranian diplomats, force the Ayatollah to release Arab political prisoners back in Iran, and then their plan was to release the hostage well, to take the hostages to Heathrow, climb onto a plane, fly back to the Middle East, and then release the hostages. They they really did not initially plan to kill anybody. They were prepared to die, and they were prepared to kill, but really their intention was to get out alive, uh, having made a very spectacular political protest. But what very few people actually know is that the, the sort of the evil genius behind this plot was Saddam Hussein. The entire plan was bankrolled and ordered and armed and financed by Saddam Hussein as a way of destabilizing the Iranian regime. Uh, he was obviously bitterly opposed to the Ayatollah. This was an opportunity to present himself as a champion of the Arab cause within Iran and a way to create real problems for Iran. In, in many ways, what happened in Prince's Gate in the, in the Iranian embassy was a precursor to the Iran-Iraq war, which erupted a few months later. In a way, you can argue that the first skirmish of that war was going to be fought out on the streets of London. Why they chose Britain was because of Britain's free press. They believed that they would get a better hearing in Britain than they would elsewhere. And they also believed that the British government was opposed to the Ayatollah, as was the American government, and that they would therefore they would get a fair hearing from the government too. So they didn't attack a, a site in Britain because they were anti-British. Oddly, quite the reverse. And the other aspect of this, which I discovered in the course of doing this research, is that the actual mastermind behind the attack was a notorious international terrorist, Abu Nidal, uh, who became the most wanted man in the world uh, for a string of brutal terrorist assaults. At this point in 1980, he was living in Baghdad and working for Saddam as a kind of freelance terrorist consultant. So... These six gunmen were in a way being manipulated. They were, they were people who had been brutalized by the conflict taking place in Iran and who were being used by Saddam and his security service, the Mukhabarat, to strike a blow against Tehran. So there is a, there is a sort of geopolitical backstory to this that, that very few people really know. And I didn't know that backstory until I read the book. And you also explained it in such clarity both there and, and in the book as well, because it's a complicated story that within okay. Iran yeah. and the Iraqi intelligence involvement. And, I mean, this, this conflict still rumbles on today. But I mean, I don't think you'd find many, one in a thousand people in Britain who would know that there was an Arab insurgency or had ever been an Arab insurgency inside Iran. But you can imagine the effect that it had on the British police in 1980 when this conflict that no one had ever heard of suddenly burst into life in front of them. I mean, it sent the poor Metropolitan Police into a crash course in the complexities of Middle Eastern politics. Even MI6 had very little idea of what this conflict was really about. That absolutely comes across in the, in the book with them scrabbling to uh, try and find out who these people are and and actually what what their 
demands are. And I think this is also occurring at the same time as the holding of the American embassy hostages in Iran. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is happening at the same time. Indeed, six days before the episode erupts in London, the American special forces had attempted to rescue the hostages held in the in the American embassy in Tehran. It was a catastrophic failure, uh, codenamed Operation Eagle Claw. It was a disaster. It didn't work at all. It, it permanently damaged Jimmy Carter's presidency. And this event took place in the shadow of that one. So unsurprisingly, lots of people assumed that it must be it must be a carbon copy. This must be in some way Islamic fundamentalists either attacking their own embassy or that it might be some retaliatory move by anti Ayatollah Iranians against the, 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 the embassy siege in Tehran. So you can imagine the confusion that it caused. I mean, it was sort of connected in the sense that the, the, the six Arab gunmen believed that, you know, attacking an embassy was, was a good way to get attention. So in that sense, they were, they were the same. But in, many, in most other ways, the two things were really not connected at all, except in this respect, which was that the Americans immediately began putting pressure on the British to solve this problem bloodlessly because they, they felt that they might be able to use that as a lever on Tehran to try to persuade the Iranians to release their hostages. So there is a kind of, there is a kind of Cold War aspect to all of this as well. Oh, yes. So can you tell me how the siege started? The six gunmen who had obtained weapons and explosives and grenades via the Iraqi diplomatic bag assembled uh, in in Hyde Park and then attacked the embassy from two directions and, and went to the front door. The person guarding the front door was... P.C. Trevor Locke, who, who might well be my favourite character in this entire story. I'm delighted to say Trevor is, is still with us, um, some age now. But So he was the diplomatic patrol group officer who was on, on duty at the front door of the embassy. Uh, Trevor is about as far from a kind of Sweeney-type cop as you can imagine. He's more of a Dixon of Doc Green man. He had joined the police in order, as he put it, to help old ladies across the road. He wanted to be a diplomatic patrol group officer because it was boring, because it didn't, you know, it wasn't going to involve anything particularly stressful. He was, however, armed like other DPG officers. Ordinary bobbies at this point still still didn't carry guns, but DPG officers did, and he had a gun under his tunic, and that gun would be hidden throughout the six day siege, and it plays a very important part of the story. But so Trevor was 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 there. He was just having a cup of coffee just inside the door when the six gunmen burst in firing their submachine guns. Some of the bullets went through a a, a glass security door and the, and the glass smashed into um, Trevor's face. He reeled backwards. They shouted in Arabic up against the wall, everybody quiet, oh we're gonna shoot people. And Sure enough, you know, there were 26 people inside the embassy at that point. Most of them were diplomatic staff. Some of them were senior Islamic diplomats. Most of them were were sort of secretaries and clerks and hospital staff and so on. There were also four British citizens. In addition to Trevor Locke, there were two BBC journalists, Sim Harris, a sound recordist, and Chris Kramer, a producer. And there was the longest serving British employee of the embassy, Ron Morris, who was the sort of chauffeur and major domo, again, as an extraordinary character. And it it has to be said, all of these people bundled together, forced into a room at gunpoint, believing they're going to die, were people who had begun the day with absolutely no inkling that any of this could conceivably happen. So in a way, this is a story about ordinary people thrust into the most appalling and terrifying circumstances beyond their control. And, and, and in a way, that's the core of the story. That's, that's about what personality and character do and what training cannot, as it were. You provide some really rich detail of the personalities, both the, the hostages and the gunmen as well. And I think that's what brings it to life. It is almost as though you are listening via the 
listening devices that MI5 and the police are, drill, are drilling in the walls. And it, it is like you were there. And I, I found it absolutely riveting. Even though you knew what was going to happen, it, it was still a page turner. Well, that's really kind of you. I mean, the truth is, in a way, I was listening to what was going on. I mean, I, you know, the transcripts and, 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 and those listening devices provide an extraordinary picture of the minute by minute developments in there. And of course, one of the reasons why I love this story is it takes place within a kind of a very small theatre. It really takes place inside one room inside the embassy. And the intensity of what was going on in there, the relationships that begin to develop among the hostages, between hostages and gunmen, the way that the relationships between the gunmen begin to break down, that is all part of this story. It's part of a sort of long running TikTok in a way that, and I mean that in the old fashioned sense, you know, that it's a countdown, something that, yes, we know that, the, 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 that this is going to end in a particular way, but we don't know how. And, and I certainly didn't when I started writing it. And it's, it's been the sort of development of those personalities that have, that have absolutely entranced me in the writing of this. I mean, quite early on in the siege, within, a, within about 24 hours, there was evidence of what, we, what is often bracketed as a term as Stockholm syndrome which I'm sure your listeners will be familiar with, some of them, which is the the situation in which hostages and hostage takers begin to develop a kind of relationship. And those who have been taken hostage begin to feel a sort of sympathy for their captors. Now, the, the flip side of Stockholm syndrome is Lima syndrome, which relates to an incident that took place in, in Peru when armed gunmen took over the Japanese ambassador's residence and took lots of, of hostages. Now, in that instance, what happened was that the gunmen began to feel sympathy for their hostages, for their captives. And that is, that is Lima syndrome. And you, within about 24 hours, these, these currents are beginning to emerge inside the embassy. And it, it really begins to dictate what is going to happen on the inside. Yeah, it, it's fascinating that the psychology that's going on, particularly around those two syndromes. I mean, I hadn't heard of Lima syndrome before, so that, that was new for me. But also the approach that the police are taking to attempt to ne negotiate with the gunman. Yes, I mean, I'm glad you raised the sort of psychological question, because, of course, the police brought in a, a wonderful man called Professor John Gunn, who is a professor of clinical forensic psychiatry, to advise them on the psychological impacts of what was going on, not just on, he was there to kind of monitor the, the sort of psychological kind of interrelations, not just between the, the, the hostage takers and, the, and, the, and their victims, as it were, but between the negotiators and, and the gunmen as well. And he is absolutely fascinating on the way that evolved. I mean, the, host, the negotiators had a really terribly difficult task ahead of them. There were six of them. They operated in shifts, two at a time, throughout 24 hours a day. And they had a really difficult task. Their, their role was to try to end this thing bloodlessly, to get as many hostages out and released as they possibly could, to keep it calm and to try to, to end it peacefully. Now, this was an almost impossible task because right at the beginning, Margaret Thatcher had made it crystal clear that these gunmen were not going to get what they wanted. She made it quite clear that, that the police could continue to negotiate. They could, they could negotiate over food. They could send in cigarettes. They could keep the conversation going. She would even, you know, it was even allowed that they would be able to broadcast or to have their statement broadcast on the BBC. What they were not going to do was get away with it. She was not going to allow a, a, a plane to be brought in. They were not going to be allowed to be flown home, which is really what they wanted. And... And so from the beginning, the hostage negotiators faced a really uphill battle and it took a huge psychological toll on, on some of them. It was a really tough gig. Now, the gunmen have, have captured a, a sort of motley cr crew of diplomats within the embassy because they've missed the ambassador. That's right. The ambassador has been replaced by a chargé d'affaires called Ali Afrouz, who was a devotee of the Ayatollah, a, 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 a pious and, and devout believer in Islam. But he was a pretty hopeless diplomat, the truth be told. He, he was extremely inexperienced. And he had, he'd only been in post for a, for a couple of months. He didn't, you know, he didn't, he, he, he barely got his feet under the table. So as it were, there were, there were a group of diplomats who, whose main 
criteria for being appointed to these roles was that they were loyal to the Ayatollah and his regime. Now, one of them is particularly important, a man called Abbas Lavassani, who was in the, in the press department. He was a press attaché. He was, he'd taken part in the storming of the U.S. embassy in Iran uh, the previous year. He was, a, he was an important figure in some ways because he was also a revolutionary guard. Uh, unbeknown, in fact, to many of the other people, but known to the Iranian staff, he was really a spy for the Ayatollah to keep an eye on the ideological conformity of the others. Abbas Lavasani is absolutely vital to this story because he is, in his way, as extreme and committed as any of the gunmen. And as the story progresses, the conflict between he and some of the, the people holding them hostage begins to become extremely aggressive. So there are divisions between and among the diplomats as well. So they are indeed a sort of motley crew. The other part of this story that's never really been told is that there were six women hostages in there. They've, th- their stories have never come to light because nobody ever asked them what it had felt like. They were all secretaries, some of them very experienced, but they were all absolutely critical to the way the thing unfolded. That's very clear in the story there. And I knew of the event but didn't know the details. And you're absolutely right. You make sort of assumptions or your memory is incorrect. And this gave so much detail. And there were quite a few pages when I went, wow, I didn't know that. Um, You and me both, actually. And I mean, I set out on this thinking that I had a pretty good grip on on what this was about. But actually, I really didn't. And that is the way with, with sort of myths, isn't it? Is that we sort of take them at face value. I mean, the other element of this, of course, is is the role of the SAS in all of this. The SAS was largely unknown until this happened. They were a shadowy elite force operating in Northern Ireland, operating in other parts of the world, but they really didn't have the public profile that they would have after the Iranian embassy siege. They were absolutely catapulted into the limelight in ways that some within the regiment feel was, was not very good for it. It, it meant that it could no, no longer really operate covertly. And, and ever since, you can argue that the regiment has sort of struggled between sort of maintaining the secrecy and mystique and, and being sort of public figures. I mean, all the sort of modern TV programs about, you know, how tough are you, you know, how, who dares wins, those are really all descendants of this particular event when the SAS blasted its way into sitting rooms all over Britain, you know, via via the television. So the SAS role is is a very interesting one. So what is the situation like in the embassy in the first few days? It's extremely tense. It is, in some parts, it is quite hopeful. I mean, people like Sim Harris, the BBC sound recorder, he was an experienced foreign correspondent, believed that this this was going to blow over pretty quickly. Others were not so sanguine. Uh, there's another key figure here who is a man called Mustafa Karkuti, who was a Syrian journalist, who was the only person in the embassy who spoke all three languages in which this drama was being played out. He spoke, he spoke Arabic, which was his native tongue. He spoke perfect English. And he also spoke Farsi. So he could speak the language not just of the diplomats, but also of the gunmen. So he became a sort of vital interlocutor between the different parties. And he cottoned on pretty early on that this was good, probably going to end in violence, that, that, it, that it was... And he did his best. He did an astonishing job of, of talking to all the various parties. And he was quite sympathetic, in a way, to the Arab gunmen. He, he himself was a Palestinian supporter of, of the Palestinian cause. He, you know, he'd been pretty radical in his youth. And in fact, MI5 had a file on him. And when they discovered that he was inside the embassy, they began to wonder whether he was involved in it, whether he'd actually had a hand in it, which he didn't. So, so yes, in a weird way, it it develops its own routine, as even though that sounds a bit of an odd thing for something that is so dramatic, it, it developed a kind of rhythm. And the people inside got to know each other. And cleverly, the, the police began to provide meals for them. And they began to provide, you know, meals to order. You know, the, the Iranian food was produced by a local Iranian restaurant, you know, and, and they had what were really sort of picnics sitting around having these discussions when they would talk about themselves. One of the things the lead gunman asked everybody to do was to introduce themselves and to 
and to give an account of who they were and where they came from. So you've got this bizarre situation where the, it's almost like a sort of diplomatic gathering where these people are all sort of standing around chit-chatting and sort of um, talking about themselves. And then at night being herded, the men and the women into different rooms under gunpoint and 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 at high moments of stress being told that they're about to be killed. So you've got this strange situation. At the same time, the police, first of all, they cut off all the telephones eventually and the telex machine. It took them a while to do it. So they isolated um, the place, which is one of the key elements of any hostage situation is that you you cut them off from the outside world. Um, the second thing they did was to introduce a field telephone, which is a sort of a, a sort of two way telephone on a wire, often used in sort of um, military situations, so, which was directly connected to the negotiating team about th- who were now stationed about three or four doors down on Prince's Gate, so that the gunman could pick up the telephone and contact the police whenever they wanted to, or, or if they wanted cigarettes, or if they wanted, you know, more time, or they wanted to discuss. So, so that was a way of diffusing the situation. Of course, what the gunmen didn't know was that um, the police had inserted a listening device into that telephone, which meant that um, they could hear what was going on inside the embassy, even when the telephone was was on the hook. I mean, that and that was that proved to be the most valuable eavesdropping device of, of many that they managed to in, introduce into the building. So you've got a system whereby there is a kind of rhythm going. But at the same time, the gunmen are becoming increasingly frustrated by, first of all, by the British refusal to broadcast their statement, you know, that the statement of what they wanted in Arabistan, as they called Khuzestan. Secondly, by Thatcher's flat refusal, really, to allow Arab ambassadors to negotiate. That was one of their demands, was that they would they wanted to have either the Syrian or the Algerian or, or, or another Arab ambassador to act as a kind of a negotiator for them and so that they could sort of speak through him. Now, at one point, the Arab ambassadors seemed to be prepared to do this. Thatcher didn't want that. She didn't want anybody getting in the way. So that was, again, a, a sort of mounting frustration to the gunman. And, and, and then there is also the effect of sleeplessness. The truth is the gunman for more than five nights had no sleep at all. And, and the hostages got precious little. And so the effect of that was ratcheting the tension up inside. And it finally led to a confrontation inside the embassy. This happened when one of the gunmen found a, a magic marker pen and began to draw anti-Khomeini slogans on the walls. Now, when the more sort of extreme of the diplomats saw this happening they protested and said you know this is you know you are accusing the ayatollah of of, you know it is blasphemy this is not acceptable but there was one in particular abbas lavasani the one i mentioned before the revolutionary guard who stood up and tore his shirt apart and said if you want a martyr i will be the martyr well that was a mistake in retrospect because the, the the deputy leader of the gunmen, who was himself an extremely radicalized and, and sort of brutalized figure, decided that this was a moment of, of real confrontation. And he very nearly killed him on the spot. But eventually he would become the first victim of the Iranian embassy siege. The gunmen are getting rattled by noises in the wall and... They're, they're hearing strange things around them, mm-hmm. which is making them very suspicious that someone's going to break in through the wolves any moment. Absolutely. It would be comical if it wasn't so terrifying. There is a moment when the lead gunman, Taufik, summons Trevor Locke, the policeman, and says, there are, there are noises in the wall, there are noises in the wall, what is happening? And Trevor Locke comes up to the wall and takes off his hat and listens to the very to carefully to the, to the wall and then turns around him and says, I think there are mice. I mean, the reality, of course, was that MI5 um, and the police technicians were drilling into the building on either side to try and insert audio probes to hear what was happening. Uh, in order, um, and once it became clear that the gunmen were becoming rattled by this, they, they came up with what seems, in retrospect, to be a sort of mad plan. They decided that in order to cover the noise of the drilling, they would make a bigger noise and they brought in the gas board who started and they started digging up the street about 100 yards away making an incredible racket in the middle of the of the night 
to try to disguise the noise of the drills being put into the embassy. Now, that, of course, had exactly the opposite effect. What that did was it made the gunmen even more twitchy because they thought that this must be cover for some armed assault. And it very nearly led to a to a real to a terrible moment. But in fact, so again, when the authorities realized that this was backfiring, they stopped that drilling and came up with an even more ingenious plan, which was that they contacted the Civil Aviation Authority and persuaded the air traffic controllers at Heathrow to divert planes so that they would rumble low over the embassy. An incredible noise at that point, because of course planes were not only louder, they were flying much lower. And under cover of that noise, they would do a bit of drilling. So as the planes were coming in, the drilling would start up again on the grounds that no one would be able to hear it. And then as the planes, as the sound rumbled away, they would stop. It sounds very sort of Tom and Jerry in retrospect, but it worked. By the end of the six days, they didn't have anything like perfect coverage of what was going on, but they were eavesdropping on a lot of conversations. Brilliant ingenuity there. One of the things that surprised me reading the the, the book was that the police negotiators were sort of insulated from other sort of plans were being made, particularly around the SAS. This is a classic police tactic. The police negotiators need to be able to deal with the gunmen, the hostage takers, in good faith. They can only ever act as sort of intermediaries to hire up. So, so when the gunmen say, you know, we want more food or we want a broadcast done, the hostage negotiator says, yes, well, thank you very much, Tafik. I'll talk to the bosses about that. What the, what the hostage negotiators cannot do is, is no more than, than, than they let on. So, so, for example, had the negotiators let slip that they knew about conversations, for example, that were taking place in the embassy, that would immediately have tipped off the gunman to the notion that they were being eavesdropped on. So, so that fact, the fact that eavesdropping devices were being burrowed in, on all sides into the embassy was kept from the negotiating team in case it led to a slip. And that was generally the case. The negotiating team knew only what they needed to know in order to negotiate and no more. They had no idea, for example, that the SAS was physically next door to the building. They'd, they'd moved into number 15 on the night of the, of the first assault and, and were preparing to go in. That was, that was unknown to the, to the police negotiators. And how are the SAS planning this assault? How, how are they putting that plan together and, and trying to make sure that everything's going to go clockwork? Well, again, this is something that very few people know. Back in 1972, in the wake of the Munich Olympic massacre, the British government decided that there had to be some sort of contingency planning for, in case a similar hostage situation arose in the UK. And from that moment on, the SAS was tasked with the job of keeping a team on permanent standby in Hereford, able to cope, trained to cope with hostage-taking situations. Now, in, in the middle of the Hereford barracks in, in the Bradbury Lines, as, as they were called then, there is something called the Killing House, which is a sort of purpose-built sort of ordinary house that is used for hostage situations. And it's lined with sort of bullet absorbing material. And the, the training, broadly speaking, goes like this. The, the SAS burst in, try to identify who are gunmen and who are hostages, try and neutralize the gunmen and rescue the hostages. Now, believe it or not, the royal family is taken to this place. It's called the killing house every so often to experience what it would be like to be kidnapped and liberated by the SAS. So by the time the Iranian embassy siege happens, the SAS has been training for a moment like this for eight years. The only thing that has ne they've never done is an actual hostage rescue. But they've, they've trained and they train and they train and, and, and the different SAS squadrons train in rotation. So there is always one ready to go. And in, in this instance, this was B squadron of 22 SAS um, with uh, the officer in command of, of 22 SAS was... Colonel Michael Rose, uh, and the person in charge of B Squadron was Hector Gullen, someone, again, who's never, ever told their story before. But he was the man responsible for drawing up what would become Operation Nimrod, which was the contingency planning for when 
mm. or if the SAS had to go in. Now, he, along with many of the others involved, never believed it would really be, have to be happened. They, they had been in these situations before and they'd never actually had to implement it. It was really only in the last 48 hours that Gullen and his men realised that there was a growing likelihood that they would have to put Operation Nimrod into, into action. And it was a highly complex, multifaceted plan. It, it involved all sorts of different moving parts. The, the assault would take place on five different levels, from the front, the basement, the back, abseiling down the back onto the second floor, and then two teams going down the central well that ran down the middle of the building. So it was really it was an all-out, what they call a stronghold assault. But it was highly, highly dangerous. And even, even the planners, even, even Peter de la Billiere, the head of special forces who was advising Margaret Thatcher, told her the likelihood is that 40% of the people in that building will become casualties of one sort or another. You know, so they knew that, that whatever they did, they were up against heavily armed, highly volatile men with explosives I mean, who had consistently threatened to blow up the entire building. Now, for all their listening devices, MI5 and, and the police could not be sure whether or not that building had been mined, whether or not it was rigged with explosives. And there was a chance, and everyone knew it, that the minute the SAS went in, the entire building might explode killing everybody inside it. Which sort of neatly brings us to day six of the siege, where the situation is reaching a crisis point. Can you take me through what happens that day? Yes, the breaking point happens in the morning when the, the gunmen have really kind of given up on, on getting what they want and, and, and feel that they had to do something. They had to make, make it clear that they were serious about what they were doing. Uh, there was a tremendous fight among them about what to do. But in fact, the number two, Jassim, was the one who kind of prevailed in the end. And Abbas Lavasani, the revolutionary guard, the, the Iranian hardline devotee, was taken downstairs, tied to a banister and executed. He was shot with several bullets to the back of his head by Jassim. Now, None of the hostages witnessed that moment, although Trevor Locke had seen this poor man being tied up and, and believed he knew what was coming. They hadn't witnessed it. Outside the building, the gunfire was heard, but and indeed on the listening devices, but no one could be sure that someone had been killed. Thatcher had laid down a, a red line. She had said that if one hostage is killed, then we will try to continue negotiations because it is possible that we can achieve a bloodless end. If two die, that is the red line. That is the moment that the SAS go in. So they had reason to believe that, that there had been gunfire, but they couldn't be sure. It took another six hours of sort of fruitless negotiations and back and forth before there was another burst of gunfire inside the building. And moments later, the body of Abbas Lavasani, who had in fact been dead for six hours, was now pushed outside onto the front step. A very swift post-mortem established that he had been dead for some considerable period, which meant that there had been the, the, possibly the second set of, of shots that had been heard might be another execution. And John Dello, the policeman in charge of the whole operation, came to the conclusion that there was a high likelihood that two hostages had now been killed. In fact, only one had by this point. Uh, this was a bluff by Taufik, but no one could know that. Dello formally handed over control to the SAS. Uh, the Home Secretary, sitting in the Emergency Cobra Committee, was informed of what was happening. He contacted Margaret Thatcher on the radio telephone in her car. She was driving back from Chequers at this point. And in, in one of those twists that could really only happen in a, in a movie or a Hollywood script, you know, she couldn't, she couldn't hear him on the telephone. The reception wasn't good enough. Uh, so they had to move on, and eventually they did get through. Um, and she gave authorization for Operation Nimrod from a lay-by north of High Wycombe. Um, she said, "You yes, go in. Uh, and for the first time in 20th century history, civilian control was handed over to the military temporarily. It, it was formally done, and the military were then in charge of what was what was going to happen. And Operation Nimrod was launched. It would last... 11 minutes. It was a very short time. It, the story of what happened in those 11 minutes takes up roughly a quarter of the entire book because 
it's extraordinarily dramatic. In effect, you have sort of six different battles taking place all over that building. It's not just the footage that you see at the front. There are people abseiling down the back. One of the leaders of one of the teams get got caught in his abseiling gear and suspended upside down over the back, the rear balcony at a time when the flashbangs that they'd thrown in to kind of neutralise the people in, inside had already set fire to the room and and fire was billowing out. So he was he was quite literally being roasted alive at the back of the building. I mean, he was he was saved in the end. Somebody above him managed to cut the rope at the right moment and he got away. At the same time, you have the people going through the front windows who expect to go in unopposed. That It is not thought that there's anyone in the front of the building. But in fact... The intelligence, while it was very good, was not perfect. The, the gunmen were not where they were supposed to, to be and expected to be. Uh, the hostages were not where they were believed to be. Um, the whole thing kicked off with an enormous explosion. Several pounds of explosives, plastic explosives, were lowered down the middle of the building into the void the, the sort of around which the building was built. Now, at the bottom of that void, at, at the bottom of the first floor, was a glass and steel atrium roof. The idea was that the lead gunman, Taufik, the, the attack would take place while he was on the field telephone. Now, the cord of that field telephone had been carefully measured, uh, and so therefore they knew how long it was, and therefore they thought they knew where he should be if he was on the telephone, or at least they knew he had to be within a certain radius. The reality was he'd actually, what he'd done was he threaded the cord of the telephone up to the first floor and he wasn't standing in the hallway as expected. He was actually on the on the landing of the first floor. So when the bomb went off, about two and a half tonnes of metal and glass and plaster and rubble went crashing down into the hallway. The idea was that this was going to flatten the, the lead gunman and and put him out of action, or as, as Hector Gullen puts it, give him a very close haircut. In fact, it missed him completely. Um, and it, and you can hear this happening live on the telephone as he is talking to the police negotiator, who is trying to keep him on the telephone so that Operation Nimrod can go into action. So you've got all these things happening at the same time and, and different conflicts t- breaking out between the different groups of, of SAS and the different gunmen who are positioned at different points in the building. I won't I won't give away exactly what happens, but it's it is it is a moment of high drama. In the meantime, the hostages are trying to get out. And and at least two of the gunmen begin to open fire, they again at the huddled male hostages in one corner of one of the rooms at the front. Several of them are extremely gravely injured. One is killed outright. That is the second fatality of the Iranian embassy siege. But miraculously, most of the hostages survive, apart from these two, and all but one of the gunmen are killed. By the, by the attacking SAS, it, it appears like what could go wrong does go wrong. What with the guy abseiling down and getting stuck, they're using these charges on the windows, which they've never used before, mm. and they decide, well, we better go for the the most amount we can put on here, and you know, almost take the front of the embassy off. They do. I mean, they put uh, far too much explosive and the, almost the entire balcony dematerialises. I mean, it's like most plans. You can you can plan and plan. And Hector Gullen is, is fascinating on this subject. He says you can make as many plans as you like, but the other side is also planning. And you cannot anticipate everything. I mean, in the end, the success of the Iranian embassy siege assault comes down to three things, I think. I mean, one is training. I mean, the SAS were highly trained. They, they, pretty much every contingency they, they, they'd looked at. The second was that they were able to adapt to changing circumstances. They couldn't know exactly what was going on inside. It was filled with tear gas and smoke and fire and, and, and gunfire everywhere. And yet they were able to sort of keep their cool and, and get through it. So enormous courage is one of the other factors. And the other, in truth, Ian, is raw luck. They were incredibly lucky. Talk to any of them today and they will quite humbly say, yeah, we were good, but the truth is we were incredibly lucky. There was only one minor injury among the attacking SAS force. And you mentioned the the gunman that survived. Now, he was basically saved by the other hostages, particularly the women hostages. 
Yes, I mean, he had hidden himself. I mean, he's the youngest, the most naive. He really had not a clue what was going on. He was, you know, he was manipulated, really. And I don't, listen, I'm not excusing him. He, you know, he took part in a brutal, murderous terrorist attack. But he was he was a fool, as most people involved in, in these sort of situations are. He, he was terrified. And as the SAS were storming in, he, he threw down his guns and, and hid among the hostages. So as they were being handed down the stairs, he sort of he sort of secreted himself among the women. And as the hostages were being laid out in the back, I mean, one of the things the police did was that when they got them onto the back lawn, they were all handcuffed, laid on their faces and handcuffed, because, of course, they couldn't know who were gunmen and who were not. And as they were going through them, the, the one survivor, Fauzi Nejad, was spotted by Sim Harris, in fact, who said, that one's a terrorist, that one's a terrorist. And at that point, it's very, it's, it is confused and it is uncertain what was then happening. But certainly some of the, the hostages believed that, that the SAS were preparing to drag Fauzi back inside the building and finish him off. Now, the SAS hotly denies this and there is no final proof either way. But what is clear is that the women hostages gathered around the one surviving gunman. And here's your evidence of Stockholm syndrome if you ever needed it. And said, no, no, you can't. You, you know, leave him alone. Don't hurt him. He's our brother. So you know, you get a sense of quite what had happened inside the building. So yes, he was, he was identified. He was. I mean, one thing we know for certain is that the SAS did not kill him because he was carted away uh, in handcuffs, tried for murder, and 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 served a very very long prison sentence. So he is the one survivor uh, among them. Right at the start, we talked about. PC Trevor Locke, the the British Bobby, who I think you you said he he's probably one of the great heroes of of this story. I mean, he's managed to conceal his gun for six days. His wife had given him, I think, two jumpers to wear so he wasn't cold, and he's kept his tunic and coat on through that entire time, and has not been to the loo either because he's afraid that it will reveal the fact he's carrying a revolver well it's an extraordinary and again it would be comical if it wasn't so extraordinary yes he realized i mean what used to happen was that the gunman would allow people to go to the to the loo but they would accompany them you know and and trevor quickly realized that if he tried to to go to the loo he'd have to take his jacket off and if he took his jacket off they'd see his gun so he didn't he really ate and drank almost nothing while he was inside that embassy. It's it's really one of the most heroic cases of self-imposed constipation you could ever imagine. But he managed to do it and he kept the gun hidden throughout until the very, very final moments when he and the lead gunman, Taufik, found themselves in a death grapple in, in one of the rooms. They'd been talking on the telephone and he produced the gun from his belt. And, and Taufik was absolutely astonished, suddenly realising that this policeman had had a gun on him the whole time. It's a fascinating moment because, as Trevor describes it, he, he had to make the choice about whether or not to use the gun, whether or not to actually kill Taufik at that moment. And in the end, he, he couldn't do it. He didn't have to because seconds later, the SAS burst in and 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 did it themselves but he's fascinating about all of that and he, even today he's he's the most remarkable man because he really did not want to be i mean it's such an overused word but he had no intention of being a hero he wasn't trained for that kind of thing he wasn't you know heroism was the last thing he wanted and yet somehow at the last moment he had found the courage to kind of this resource, this reservoir that he never knew he had. And without Trevor Locke, I think, who, who who became a kind of an emblem of resilience to the other hostages throughout. He never took his cap off, for example. You know, he sat on the main chair in the hostage room the whole time because he realised that he had to become a sort of symbol of solidity and and quietness and, and defence, as it were, without confronting the, the gunman. And I think without him... The whole story could have ended in an absolute tragedy. So, so Trevor Locke deserves certainly deserves the medal he got, but he's never, up until now, he's never really talked about what the experience was like for him. And I think it left him with, as it did many of the, the hostages, with deep psychological scars. <laughs> 
it's the the depth of the psyche of the both the hostages and the terrorists that you get into i i think is is one of the fascinating bits as you say you know the the ending of the siege is a big chunk of the book but the the bits that i found particularly fascinating was how the psychology changed you know how the the pressure is ratcheted up and how one of those hostage negotiations is dealt with yeah I mean, it's almost a science these days. The whole the whole issue of how you talk to hostage takers, how how you how you deal with a situation like that. Then in 1980, it was really in its infancy. There wasn't a structured way of approaching these things. And and all credit really to the police for the way they tried to do it. Again, they were they were sort of damaged by this experience. They felt some of them that they had failed. Their job was to try to save lives, to try to prevent this ending in bloodshed. And certainly Dello and some of the others felt that at the last, you know, they had not been able to do what they set out to do. And so that, too, had a kind of long term effect on all of them, I think. We talked at the, at the start about the legacy of the siege and the sort of publicity that the SAS now got. I think you, you talk about it in the book where there was a sudden rise in people at the army recruitment centres expecting to be handed a balaclava and a submachine gun over the counter. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of... Uh, Peter de la Billiere is very funny about this. I mean, yes, applications to join the regiment rocketed. No one had ever heard of the SAS before. Suddenly, they were, you know, die-hard, daring-do celebrities, and everybody wanted to join the regiment. One other impact was that other countries began asking Britain to loan out the SAS to train their own people and to help them with other hostage situations. It raised Britain's military profile in an extraordinary way. There are people within the SAS today who say that actually that the longer term impact on the SAS was not very healthy, that that they had gone from being sort of hidden warriors to suddenly being in the limelight, and that made their job much more difficult. You can argue that the SAS has been wrestling with the kind of as it were, the tension between celebrity and mystery and secrecy ever since. You know, they, 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 all of those programmes that you see on television, you know, Who Dares Wins and all that sort of how tough are you stuff, it sort of comes from this moment when the SAS revealed themselves to be these these sort of, as John le Carre put it, action men personified. So it has, it has a long-term effect on the SAS. It also, as I think I mentioned at the beginning, had, had an effect on Thatcher's premiership. She had not been in power for very long. This clearly demonstrated that she was the Iron Lady. She was not going to give in to terrorism. That, again, informed her approach to, to terrorism in Northern Ireland. It perhaps even informed the Falklands decision. The SAS became, in a way, Thatcher's army. They, they were deployed in the Falklands. And some of her sort of some of the more gung-ho attitudes towards that conflict sort of in a way stemmed from this one. And and in the wider world, it, it was also highly significant. As I said, this was really the first shot in the Iran-Iraq war. That hot, appalling conflagration erupted a few months later. Without the Iran-Iraq war, you wouldn't have the first Gulf War. Without that, you wouldn't have the second Gulf War and then Afghanistan and then 9-11. I mean, the, 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 there is a there is a continuum. This 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 event plays a significant role in the continuum of that story. And even today, you know, we are we are in the midst of appalling hostage situations. And again, these are circumstances when people who believe they are in the right believe that they have virtue on their side on both sides come into conflict, and it produces appalling appalling results. So, you know, this is, in a way, this, although this is a story is 40 years old or 43 years old, it is still a story of, of modern times. Presumably you've watched the Six Days movie. I, I didn't, Ian. I, I made a point of, of not watching it, partly because so many people in the SAS were enraged by it, um, and partly because I didn't want those visual images to affect my own imagination, if you see what I mean. I, I felt it would have been... I would inevitably have started to see, as one always does when one sees a film, to see it through the prism of that film. But I also, I, I know from reading about it, and I know from talking to people about it, that it is, I'm, I'm sure it's a perfectly good film, but, but it does take a fairly simple approach to what was going on there. Actually, the real story is, is much more complicated. 
Then I, I, I take it you've not watched the Lewis Collins Who Dares Wins either. <laughs> I haven't watched that, no. But I'm delighted to say that there is going to be a TV dramatisation of The Siege. It is going to be turned into a six-part television drama, which is very exciting and will be a great opportunity, I think, to look slightly more deeply at the things that we've been talking about, the complexity of these relationships, the the specificity of these different characters and how they slot into the story, the very many different elements that went into it, not just the hostages and the hostage takers, but the police and the gunmen and the politicians and the cabinet ministers and the ambassadors and everyone else, and indeed the press. I mean, this had a huge impact on on the world's press. It was the biggest story in the world at the time. And it changed the way that we cover live news events. This was the first time, as, as we said, that this had ever been done this way. Now we're used to it, but it really was. It was a watershed in that respect as well. I mean, it's almost like a British where were you when JFK was shot <laughs> moment yeah. um, for, for a certain generation, I think. Well, I think that is right. And and I inherited a very simple view of what had happened there. That, but And that's in a way one of the things that I've tried to do here is to is to sort of explore the mythology and to explore why myths behave this way and why memory is sometimes misleading. And and I guess I hope if the book does one thing, it will encourage people to look at this story anew, I hope, and and ask themselves perhaps a very simple, although in a way a very difficult question, uh, and perhaps unanswerable question, which is what would you have done? What would you have done if you had been one of those people who found themselves bundled into this appalling situation over which you had no control um, as a hostage. And I think we all like to think that we would behave in certain ways in certain circumstances, but you can't know. And you never know, really, until until you absolutely have to. And I found that fascinating that the different characters, some behaved in ways that we would regard as absolutely extraordinary and, and virtuous and heroic, and others did not. We are all made of complicated human timber none of us is made of straight grain and you can't know how you're going to have to respond to lethal jeopardy uh, until you have to it certainly showed me that you know you can think that you know a story and then an author like yourself produces a book like this and it's not revisionist but it just gives a load more texture and nuance to a not well, what appear to be a straightforward story. Mm. I think that is absolutely right. I think readers of history these days are highly sophisticated. They 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 approach stories not, I think, through a moral prism, uh, expecting to to be told about good and evil, right and wrong, goodies and baddies. That's that's the history of another age of, of a propagandist age. I think people are so grown up about the way they see the past that you can present them with a story that tries to tell all sides and doesn't try and crowbar history into certain uh, moral precepts, you know, bad, this was bad and that was good. History is about life and about and life is fateful and, and, and fatal and, and unfolding and unpredictable and all sorts of factors go into creating a, a, these sort of situations. And in a way, the more multifaceted and the more richly one can explore those complexities the better we understand the world and perhaps the better we understand ourselves i'm definitely with you with that absolutely absolutely now ben i can't let you go without talking to you about oleg gordievsky uh -huh. fascinating story and i know we're here to talk about the siege ben but i'd like to dig into that book if possible mm. at a later date with you sure. if you'd be up for yeah, that. Yeah, I'd be delighted to. I mean, it's a fascinating story. He is still going amazingly, Oleg. He's still in the safe house where he's lived all this time. In a way, you can argue that his story is even more relevant today than it's ever been, given the situation between Russia and Ukraine. And and yeah, I'd be delighted to do that. Yeah, just just let me know. I mean, I'd I'd love to go go through that. It's a it's an amazing tale. It's, it it absolutely is, and I'm surprised there isn't. A, a TV adaptation or a movie well, again, about that. That, or, is, or... We're, we're, that is on the launch pad. It's been difficult the last couple of years because of the writer's strike and various other things. But there's a brilliant screenwriter called Alex Carey who wrote the screenplay for another of my books, A Spy Among Friends. And he is working on The Spy and the Traitor. And he's done a 
a first episode and it's absolutely brilliant so i have high hopes that that will come to the screen and again because it's going to be done as a tv series i think there's an opportunity to make it more than simply an adventure and an escape story we can i hope we can really dig into some of the fascinating cold war elements that go into that tale well definitely want to do that then Um, mark me down for that ian put me down for that lovely Excellent. That's what I like to hear. The book that we've been talking about today is Ben McIntyre's The Siege, the remarkable story of the greatest SAS hostage drama. There will be links in the episode notes as to how to buy the book and support the podcast. And I'll also be putting links there into the TV footage of the ending of The Siege. It's well worth watching. Can't guarantee there'll be a snooker final in there. The episode extras such as videos, photos and other content are available via a link in the episode information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous efforts of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and look forward to seeing you next week.